Welcome in to today's edition of Just a True. Glad to have you join me in the PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition Studio. To lose weight for the last time, visit myphdweightloss.com. Welcome in as we kick off another week. Hope you had a great long Memorial weekend. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. A lot to cover as we kick off on a Tuesday. I always get confused when I start my week on Tuesday. Predictions vary widely as the verdict looms in the New York Trump trial. Closing arguments and jury deliberation are set for today. We may know something this week. It could be next week. We'll talk all about that, give you an update. Israel faced new condemnation yesterday for strikes on the southern Gaza city of Rafah that Hamas terrorist-run Gaza Health Ministry said killed at least 45 Palestinians, including displaced people living in tents where, that were engulfed by fire, we're told, including women and children. Also, four U.S. Army vessels supporting the humanitarian floating pier mission in Gaza became unmoored by rough seas and have washed ashore in Israel, according to U.S. military officials. President Biden made a surprise nighttime visit to the Delaware home of Hallie Biden on Sunday evening, just before she's due to serve as one of the most important witnesses at first son Hunter Biden's federal trial for alleged gun crimes. Now, what could Joe Biden have possibly needed to speak with her about on a Sunday evening? I told you we'd be back. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's Joey Hudson. I wanted to name it the Joey Hudson Bill, but, you know, they don't allow you to name put names on bills, <laughs> but I wanted to call it the Joey Hudson Bill because I know, I know that one's been near and dear to you for a number of years. That's how it's done. Let your voice be heard. And the truth shall set you free. Here's Joey Hudson. Let's start in New York after a couple of months of watching the circus in Judge Juan Merchant's court. We could be getting some results later this week or maybe sometime next week. The Epic Times did a great analysis of the overall case this weekend, pointing out that Justice Merchant has often ruled for the prosecution on key evidentiary issues, while commentators are sharply divided on the actual merits of the criminal case itself. As lawyers in the criminal trial, former President Donald Trump prepared to deliver their summations today, And the jury makes ready to begin deliberating as soon as the middle of the week. Speculation runs high as to whether proceedings will end in an acquittal, a guilty verdict, or a hung jury. And what's the response to any one of these scenarios? What happens if he's acquitted? What happens if he's guilty? What happens if the jury can't make a decision? The Epic Times writes, if President Trump is convicted... Evidentiary concerns and Justice Juan Merchant's conduct are likely to raise substantive issues for the defense to pursue at the appellate level, according to one legal expert, but other judicial experts disagree, saying it's premature to try to assess the trial's fairness. Throughout the trial, and we've watched this, we've seen the highlights, and we've uh, heard them reported, not only by those in the courtroom, but uh, each day, Donald Trump has given us an update as he leaves the court of what was said during that day. Justin Merchant has, uh, Justice Merchant has consistently sustained prosecutors' objections to defense lawyers' questions and has made concessions to the government while denying a bulk of defense motions. Mark Clawson is a professor of law and constitutional theory at Cedarville University in Ohio. He studied the proceedings closely from day one. He spoke with the Epic Times. In addition, the judge's words and actions during a highly tense moment in the courtroom this week uh, as uh, defense witness Robert Costello, a fellow uh, prosecutor, a a former federal prosecutor, I should say, uh, they say renders the judge vulnerable to the very charges of unseemliness he leveled at Mr. Costello. Mr. Mr. Clawson wrote, I've been following all the ins and outs and nuances of the trial. District Attorney Alvin Bragg made very public statements about his desire to, quote, get Trump, so it certainly looks political. Furthermore, there are a lot of things that the judge has done wrong and that can be raised on appeal. Uh, Look, I I think we probably are going to see an appeal regardless of the outcome. If Trump is convicted, he will certainly appeal. If he's acquitted, I I suggest that Alvin Bragg will probably appeal. If there's a hung jury, I don't know what either side does. Trump, of course, it, that would be a win for him. I don't know what uh, Alvin Bragg would do from there. With closing arguments scheduled for later this morning, the prosecution of 
President Donald Trump will finally head to a jury and it'll be in their hands. Judge Juan Merchant has refused every opportunity to bring an end to this, what we all know is a politically manufactured prosecution. This is politics at its ugliest. Now it's going to be up to 12 New Yorkers to do what neither the court nor the prosecutors were willing to do. Adhere to the rule of law regardless of the identity of the defendant. It's almost like they have gone out of their way to make sure that this defendant, Donald J. Trump, did not receive a fair trial. Judge Merchant has allowed the government to bring back into life a what, what many legal scholars have called a dead misdemeanor. And somehow it's been converted into 34 felony counts of falsifying business records in the first degree. To accomplish this legal regeneration, uh, Epic Times writes, Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg has vaguely referenced a variety of crimes that Trump allegedly was trying to conceal through the business record violations. The problem is, according to the Epic Times, is that he's left the secondary crime mired in uncertainty to the point that experts on various networks are still debating what the underlying theory is in the case. When you have political pundits, when you have legal analysts, people like Jonathan Turley, when they don't even understand what the, what the legal theory is in a case, you know that there's something odd, don't you? You know that there's a problem. Over on foxnews.com, uh, Fox News legal analyst Jonathan Turley wrote over the weekend, Mr. Bragg is expected to finally state with clarity what he is alleging at the closing arguments of the case. We can only, we can only hope. Turley wrote, in the meantime, the prosecution is pushing to make it easier for the jury to convict. First, they have vaguely referenced a variety of possible offenses from tax to election violations. Bragg initially laid out four possible predicate uh, crimes. It is down to three, a tax crime and violations of state or federal election law. Turley goes on to write, Merchant has ruled that the jury does not have to agree on what crimes were being covered up, so the jury could literally have three different views of what happened in the case and still convict Donald Trump. Prosecutors are also seeking to effectively shorten the playing field by allowing the jurors to convict on a lower standard of proof for the key term in using unlawful means. Turley goes on to write, the defense wants the jury instructed that it must find that such a use of unlawful means was done with willful intent. The prosecutors do not want to use that higher standard. For the defense, it is effectively reducing the field to the end zone to make it easier for the prosecution to score. And that's the whole idea. That's why Judge Merchant has allowed the prosecution to run rapid, to run wild. But yet, any objection that the defense brings up has been overruled time after time. Turley, uh, Turley writes, in the last few days, the Bragg strategy has come into sharper focus in one respect. Bragg is not counting on the evidence or the law. He is counting on the 12 members of the jury. Turley says, call it the Lawrence O'Donnell strategy. And, and believe me, this is no legal strategy that any law students ever studied about in, in law school. This is a relatively new term that uh, Turley has coined. He says, after Michael Cohen imploded on the stand in the trial, even experts and hosts on MSNBC and CNN stated that his admissions and contradictions were devastating. Cohen is not only accused of committing perjury in his testimony, but he matter-of-factly detailed how he stole tens of thousands of dollars from the Trump organization. He, he admitted that he had stolen from his boss. He admitted that he had actually committed a crime. Uh, Turley writes, after being disbarred and convicted as a serial perjurer, Cohen waited for the statute of limitations to run out on larceny to admit that he stole as much as $50,000 by pocketing money intended for a contractor. Liberal commentators acknowledge the fact that Cohen had committed a far more serious offense than the converted misdemeanor against Trump, but was never charged. Yet one figure stepped forward to assure the public that all is well. Turley goes on to write, MSNBC host O'Donnell, and this is how he came up with the O'Donnell defense. O'Donnell said that he watched the testimony and that Cohen did wonderfully. Keep in mind that Trump's lawyer, Todd Blanche, asked Cohen point blank, so you stole from the Trump organization, right? Cohen answered unequivocally, yes, sir. O'Donnell, however, rushed outside to declare that Cohen was merely acquiring a bonus that he thought that he deserved as a type of, quote, self-help. 
Cohen was trying to rebalance the bonus he thought he deserved, and it still came out as less than the bonus he thought he deserved and the bonus he had gotten the year before, O'Donnell argued. In other words, he was first determined that his employer should pay him more and then elected to lie to his employer and steal the money. It is akin to New Jersey Democrat Senator Bob Menendez claiming in his nearby trial that the gold bars and cash found in his home were just his effort to secure a well-deserved bonus for his years of public service. The world has gone crazy, folks. O'Donnell was widely mocked for his unusual spin, though. We'll see, because today they're going to start making their, their final arguments and then on to the jury. 864-477-JOEY, 864-477-5639. Send your comments to the Furman Ford text line. You can leave a quick voice message, and your emails are always welcome, Joey, at joeyhudson.com. Soon going to be four years ago that I started my journey with Ph.D. weight loss and nutrition. I lost 30 pounds pretty quickly, I might add, and I've been able to maintain that for almost four years now. It'll be four years coming up in July. If this is the year that you have decided that you're going to get healthy, that you're going to lose that weight, that visceral fat that's so uh, damaging around your your waist, then now's the time to start. Let me encourage you to make that call today. 864-252-4925. Set up your initial consultation with PhD Weight Loss and Nutritious. Boy, am I glad that I met Dr. Ashley Lucas uh, four years ago and that she got me on the right path to getting healthy. You're going to be able to do things that you may have thought you'd never be able to do again. Uh, play with the kids, the grandkids, be able to, to hike and, and walk and uh, maybe play a full 18 round, uh, hole of golf and be able to do it and not get so winded because when you take that excess weight off, you're just going to feel better. You're going to be able to focus. You're going to, be able to sleep better. Your overall health is just going to be improved. 864-252-4925. Call, set up your initial consultation. Find them online at myphdweightloss.com. PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition, the official partner of the Clemson Tigers. Okay, someone explain this one to me. President Joe Biden reportedly made a surprise nighttime visit. That's how it was reported. A night surprise nighttime visit to the Delaware home of Hallie Biden Sunday evening. Now, this is just before she is due to serve as one of the most important witnesses at first son Hunter Biden's federal trial for alleged gun crimes that is scheduled to begin June the 3rd. Biden stopped by Hallie's home. Now, remember, she was married to his son, Bo Biden, who tragically died of cancer, had nothing to do with his service in the military, as his dad often talks about. Now, the story is that he stopped by Hallie biden's home around 8 p.m for what is called a brief private talk just eight days before the 54 year old first son's trial is scheduled to stand uh trial beginning june the third hallie dated hunter you'll recall which is odd in itself that she dates her her dead husband's brother at the time of his alleged gun crimes and is one of a dozen expected witnesses Hunter and Hallie Biden had uh, an affair shortly after his, his brother, Bo Biden, died of cancer. She was married to Bo Biden, uh, who died in 2015, before her relationship with his somewhat troubled younger brother. Uh, it still makes no sense. Prosecutors allege that Hunter lied about his drug use on gun purchase forms and then briefly illegally possessed at least one weapon, which, according to reports, Halley disposed of in a public dumpster in 2018. Now, you know, for the Bidens to to be such supposedly to be such smart people. To to be the affluent power brokers that they supposedly are. I mean, Joe Biden's been at this for 40-plus years now. They're really not very good at things, are they? I mean, they're even, they're even bad criminals. Why would you throw a gun away in a public dumpster? Unless, of course, she hoped it would be found and traced back to Hunter. Who knows? Although many commentators... Noted the awkward optics due to the looming trial. The visit came four days after, uh, I'm sorry, four days before 
the anniversary of Bo Biden's death. So uh, the those who support Joe Biden are claiming that he always visits with her around the anniversary of his son's death. White House spokesperson Andrew Bates told The Post that the president didn't discuss the trial with Hallie Biden during the visit, just like he never talked about Hunter Biden's business dealings either. You believe him? Do you believe that the president had a, uh, a visit, an unusual visit at that, with his former daughter-in-law and did not happen to discuss the fact that her ex-boyfriend, her, her, her deceased husband's brother, that she's going to be called to testify against, that they didn't talk about it? Uh, when, when asked, Bates said no. He visited her because of the approaching ninth anniversary of Bo's passing. The White House did not disclose the reason for the president's brief visit, which again was around 8 o'clock Sunday evening. Hunter Biden faces the possibility of prison time in his first of two scheduled criminal trials. Hunter is also set to stand trial, you may recall, in Los Angeles. That has been delayed to September. You know, it, it too was supposed to have been held within the next uh, couple of weeks. He tried to get this uh, June 3rd trial, uh, the gun trial, delayed as well, but was unsuccessful. So the tax ev- uh, evasion trial will be in September, and it's for failing to p- pay more than $1.4 million in federal taxes between 2016 and 2019. In February 2018, Hunter was spending $7,000 a month in rent for a home in Annapolis, Maryland, which he was sharing with his love, Hallie Biden, his brother Bo's widow. Hunter's alleged illegal firearm was thrown in a trash bin by Hallie, the first son said in text messages obtained from his abandoned laptop. I mean, he's, he's, he's his own worst enemy. We know, we know all this stuff. It's not speculation because we've read about it, we've learned about it from information that was on his laptop. So, so how do you argue with that? How is it disputed? The pair of criminal trials follow an alleged Justice Department cover-up that was designed to shield the Biden family from liability for foreign business dealings in which Joe Biden played a recurring role but denies. We all know that took place, too. Millions of dollars coming into uh, to various Biden-owned LLCs, and we're supposed to think that nothing was wrong? Uh, Hunter agreed to a probation-only plea deal, you may recall, to the gun and the tax crimes last June, but walked away from the what many considered a sweetheart deal at a July court hearing at which his attorneys demanded broad immunity of past conduct, including violations of the Foreign Agents Registration Act, which could implicate his dad. Now, Joe Biden is 81 years old. He's an attorney, a former law school instructor, although he didn't teach very much. He's boasted of his past legal exploits with the serial embellishment, telling Howard Stern just last month that as a long, young lawyer, he had worked on a couple of murder cases, though none are in the public record. No one ever knows of Joe Biden ever being involved with a murder, with a murder case. So June 3rd. That, that's the date we're going to be watching as uh, unless something happens. And look, anything can happen with the Biden family. U.S. District Judge Mark Scarcy agreed during a hearing to push the case for the taxes to September 5th after defense lawyers said that they'd need more time to prepare with Hunter uh, for the case. But the June 3rd is set to begin in Delaware. The president's son has pleaded not guilty to both indictments, which his lawyers have claimed are politically motivated. Well, they should know what politically motivated looks like because they certainly have instigated politically motivated trials against Donald Trump. Both cases are being overseen by judges nominated by then-President Donald Trump, a Republican, of course. Uh, The irony of that, that Donald Trump appointed the two judges who will oversee Hunter Biden's criminal trials. 864-477-JOEY, 864-477-5639. 
Send your comments to the Furman Ford text line. You can leave a quick voice message, and your emails are always welcome, Joey, at joeyhudson.com. Whether you're replacing a broken appliance or maybe you're just upgrading, you're totally remodeling the kitchen. When it's time to get those new appliances, when you're ready for them, you don't want to have to wait weeks or even months to get started using them, right? Well, that's not the case when you shop with my friends at Discounted Appliance Warehouse. With over 11,000 square feet and 1,500 appliances at any, any given time, you can buy today and use today quite often. I'm talking about shopping with my friends at Discounted Appliance warehouse in pickens it's worth the short drive over to pickens jeff johnny kyle the whole team over there they'll take good care of you they have an award-winning service department expert installation extended warranties and a discounted appliance warehouse they treat you like family you're more than just a credit card swipe to all the team over there discounted appliance warehouse they're proud to offer speed queen the only washer and dryers with manufacturers warranties that cover parts and labor you owe it to yourself if you're looking for a new appliance to head over to Pickens to Discounted Appliance Warehouse online at DAWPickens.com, DAWPickens.com. Israel faced new condemnation yesterday for strikes on the southern Gaza city of Rafah that Hamas terrorist-run Gaza Health Ministry said killed at least 45 Palestinians, including displaced people living in tents that became engulfed in fire after the explosions. Many the Gaza Health Ministry say, were women and children. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that there had been a tragic mistake and that Israel was investigating what had happened. He made those those comments to Israeli uh, leaders in an address yesterday. Israel has faced surging international criticism over its war with Hamas. We've seen protests all around the country on college campuses. All we hear from the left is ceasefire, ceasefire. Even some of its closest allies, particularly uh, the United States, expressed outrage at the civilian deaths. Israel insists it adheres to international law, even as it faces scrutiny in the world's top courts, uh, one of which last week demanded that it halt the offensive in Rafah. Israel said that it uh, is looking into the claims of the civilian deaths after it struck a Hamas inst- installation killed two senior militants. Sunday night's attack, which appeared to be one of the war's deadliest, according to many reports uh, from the area, helped push the overall Ga- Gaza death toll uh, to just over 36,000. Now, this is according to the Hamas terrorist-run Gaza Health Ministry, which does not, and you need, this is important to know, does not distinguish between terrorists, fighters, and non-combatants. They just give you a total of people that they claim have been killed. In a speech before Israeli's parliament Monday, Netanyahu said, quote, Despite our utmost efforts not to harm innocent civilians, last night there was a tragic mistake. We are investigating the incident and will obtain a conclusion because this is our policy. Now, look, I'm sorry that young children, innocent children, women were killed in this. But they're also in a war. And guess who started that war? So I also, even though I feel for for these innocent families, and and look, it's horrible It's a horrible situation over there. But still, it's a war. And their people started the war. They fired the first shots when they came across the Israel border back on October 7th. Mohammed Abusa, who is said to have rushed to the scene in the northwestern neighborhood of Tel Asutan, said that rescuers pulled out people who were in an unbearable state. He said, we pulled out children who were in pieces. We pulled out young and elderly people. The fire in the camp was unreal, as he described the devastation that he found upon arriving. The Hamas terrorist-run Gaza Health Ministry said around half of the dead were women, children, and older adults. Barefoot children poked at the blackened debris that searches contained uh, on Monday in photographs that were widely circulated by the Gaza Health Ministry. Now, now keep in mind, and and I keep saying, 
and I keep saying the Gaza Health Ministry, which is run by Hamas terrorists, because it is. So you have to be sur- you have to be a, a bit leery of the reports they give us. But sometimes it's the only information that we get. But but a lot of Israel's closest allies around the the world are condemning this action. France, who is a close European ally of Israel, said it is quote outraged by the violence. President Emmanuel Macron posted on X, these operations must stop. There are no safe areas in Rafah for Palestinian civilians. I call for full respect for international law and an immediate ceasefire. Rafah, if, if you don't know, is the southernmost Gaza city on the border with Egypt. As the Israeli defense forces started in the north, where the terrorists invaded Israel last October, and they have since pushed them to the southernmost tip of Gaza. They have nowhere else to go. Netanyahu has vowed that he's going to finish this once and for all. Now, the other significant number that you need to know about Rafa is supposedly it's housing now more than a million people, about half of Gaza's total population uh, have been displaced and have gone to the southern tip of Gaza to seek shelter. Most have fled from their homes once once Israel retaliated for the October 7th attack. Hundreds of thousands were packed into what is described as squalid tent camps in and around the city, hoping to get international aid, hoping to be fed, to get water. And again, it's horrible situations. It's horrible to think of young children who have no clue why they're, they're hungry right now, why they, why they don't have clothes to wear, why they're dirty, why they're li- sleeping on the ground, because they don't understand that adults fight. In a separate development, Egypt's military said one of its soldiers was shot during uh, an exchange and died uh, during this, this exchange in Rafah. They did not have full details or did not release full details. Israel said that it was in contact with Egyptian authorities, and both sides said that they were investigating this incident as well. Netanyahu says that Israel must destroy what he calls Hamas's last remaining battalions in Rafah. The militant group launched a barrage of rockets Sunday from the city towards heavily populated central Israel, setting off air raid sirens, fortunately causing no injuries. Italian Defense Minister Guido Corsetto said bombings like the one in Rafa will have long-standing repercussions for Israel. He told Italy Sky TG24 News Channel Israel with this choice is spreading hatred, rooting hatred that will involve their children and grandchildren. I would have preferred another decision. But it's easy for him to say that. And it's easy for the French president to say it because they're sitting in their cushy palaces and their people are fine. They weren't attacked on October 7th by a bunch of terrorists. Qatar, a, a key mediator between Israel and Hamas uh, in attempts to secure this ceasefire that everyone's talking about and the release of hostages. Have you noticed how you hear so much talk about the ceasefire, but you don't hear a lot of talk about releasing the hostages? I mean, when when the French president called for an immediate ceasefire, he didn't mention release the hostages as well. When this Italian defense minister uh, also called for an immediate ceasefire, he too did not mention releasing the hostages. They never do. Again, uh, Qatar, which has played a key role in the mediation between Israel and Hamas, trying to secure a ceasefire and trying to get, get a release of the hostages held by Hamas, said that these strikes would complicate talks. Negotiations, which appear to be restarting, have faltered repeatedly over Hamas's demand for a lasting truce and the withdrawal of Israeli forces, terms Israeli leaders have publicly rejected and say they have no, no, um, no intention of doing. Netanyahu is not going to give the Gaza Strip back to the terrorists because he knows if he does, in a year, two years, five years, ten years, we're going to see this all over again. 
And I think he's going to do what he has to do to finish this once and for all, regardless of what the rest of the world thinks about it. Neighboring Egypt and Jordan, which have made peace with Israel uh, for, for decades now. I mean, they've learned to live with one another. Uh, they, too, have condemned the Rafa strikes. Egyptian uh, foreign ministry described the strike on Tel Sultan as a new and blatant violation of the rules of humanitarian international law. Jordan's foreign ministry called it a war crime. The Israeli military's top legal official said authorities were examining the strikes and that the military regrets the loss of civilian life. Mil- military Advocate General Major General Yafat Tomar Yashami said such incidents occur in a war of such scope and intensity. Yes, they do. Sadly, they do. And again, you get back to the terrorists. The Hamas terrorists are the ones who fired the first shot October 7th. Uh, by the way, news, you, you remember us talking about the, the U.S. Army aid vessels, this uh, floating humanitarian pier that the U.S. has spent millions of dollars to build to try to get food to, uh, to the Gaza area. It was reported over the weekend that two vessels that were part of that came un, uh, unmoored because of rough seas and have now floated ashore on a Gaza beach near the pier, according to U.S. Central Command. Two others are beached further north on the coast of Israel, now near Ashkelon. We're told that Israeli forces are assisting recovery efforts near the pier and that no U.S. personnel will enter Gaza to retrieve these vessels. That's all we need is for our soldiers to go to this Gaza beach to try to retrieve these uh, these vessels that were there to provide humanitarian relief. Send me a quick text with your comments to the Furman Ford text line, 864-477-5639-864-477. Joey, leave a quick voice message as well. Emails welcome Joey at Joey Hudson dot com. Eight six four four seven seven Joey eight six four four seven seven fifty six thirty nine. Send your comments to the Furman Ford text line. You can leave a quick voice message and your emails are always welcome, Joey at Joey Hudson dot com. Speaking of the Furman Ford text line, you know it's never been more important to support locally run businesses owned by people who actually live here in the upstate. Let me take a minute to talk with you about our friends at Furman Ford. If you're looking for a new vehicle, maybe a great pre-owned vehicle, one you can you can trust, or maybe you're looking to order that special vehicle. Uh, either way, if you want a new one, a brand new one, or a pre-owned that you can trust, the, the folks at Furman Ford, they're there to help you. Their name is on the sign because their name is on the line because every single tra- transaction is important to them. Jim Furman, Matthew Furman. They do business the right way. When you uh, stop by, when you give them a call, or maybe when you just uh, send them a quick email, you're always going to have access to a member of the Furman Ford family. And by the way, they also offer great service, and you're not going to have to wait weeks and weeks to get it done. And you do not have had to purchase your vehicle at Furman Ford. doesn't even have to be a Ford. They, they service all makes and models. Visit my friends at Furman Ford online at FurmanFord.com, FurmanFord.com. On the text line, texter writes, Good morning, Joey. I don't trust Nikki Haley. I believe she would try to hurt Trump even while serving as vice president. I would welcome Tim Scott. It's going to be interesting to see. And over the coming weeks, the speculation is only going to increase. Of course, Trump himself said this past week that there probably is going to be a place for Nikki Haley in his administration. This coming after she finally admitted last week to the Hudson Institute that she would, in fact, be voting for Donald Trump in November. Faye writes on the text line, Joey, we're happy you and Mike are back. Hope you and Peg had a safe weekend. Thank you, Faye. Uh, Mike and I are glad to be back as as well. You can listen to Mike Gallagher 10A to noon following the Tara show, uh, 6 to 10. Bill Frady, 12 to 3. Charlie uh, James kind of takes you home in the afternoons, 3 to 7. And Mark Levin uh, wraps things up tonight. I would say that's a winning combination right there, wouldn't you? On the text line, uh, Jade from Hendersonville says a big no to Tim Scott. Joey, he endorsed Alaska Rhino Lisa Murkowski. Texture. Carolina says, good morning, Joe. Regarding the topic of political endorsements, I also am not swayed by an endorsement. I will vote based on my research of a candidate. 
On the flip side, being a member of the North Carolina State Employee Association, I disagree with their endorsements of candidates. It does not represent me, and I wish they wouldn't do it. Uh, Carolina, Carolina is referencing a conversation we had last week about the importance of endorsements and if, in fact, endorsements worked, if they swayed how people voted. And we're going into the June 11th primaries here in South Carolina. We're having endorsements, it seems like, daily. Somebody's endorsing someone else. And my question to you was, does it matter? Do you care that another politician's in, uh, politician endorses someone else for office? Does it have any bearing on who you decide, ultimately decide to vote for? Now, there are a lot of congressional candidates uh, all around, all around the country who have received the endorsement of Donald Trump. And that was my original question to you. Let's take the 3rd Congressional District of South Carolina, for example. Pastor Mark Burns received the endorsement of Donald Trump. He's very proud of that. His radio spots talk about that. His signs have that. I uh, I was doing some, some search, searching on the Internet over the weekend, and because I do a lot of searching on political topics, I was fed digital ads of Mark Burns and, and Donald Trump, a photo of the, of the two of them together. Does it matter if you're in the third district, congressional district, do you care who endorsed Mark Burns or are you going to uh, take a look at the other candidates and vote for someone on their merits? You have uh, State Representative Stuart Jones running over there. You have uh, Kevin Bishop, longtime communications director of Senator Lindsey Graham. You've got Frankie Franco. You've got Philip Healy. Uh, I'm going to lose lose somebody out. I shouldn't have started naming these. There are like eight can seven or eight candidates over there. Jordan writes on the text line. They're calling on the halt of Rafa campaign in Israel, yet Israel was hit with a rocket barrage from Rafa today. The left knows what's going on. They just want to gain votes from playing the left side of the voting pool. Uh, Jordan, you're right. Uh, but again, I don't think I don't think this outcry is going to deter Benjamin Netanyahu. A text of encouragement today from uh, from Joel. Life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond to it. God bless. Thank you. Your comments are welcome, as always, on the text line. You can email me as well, joey at joeyhudson.com. Hope you had a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. It's always nice to have some extra time, isn't it, to spend with uh, family and friends. Of course, Memorial Day is also a time to remember those who made the ultimate sacrifice. Let's not forget the true meaning of which Congressman Ilhan Omar evidently didn't quite understand. <laughs> it should be a requirement, if you're going to serve in the United States Congress, that you have to pass a civics class. Uh, from the Daily Caller, this story, Minnesota's Democrat Representative Ilhan Omar mixed up holiday practices in a tweet Monday about Memorial Day, causing a backlash on Twitter. Here's what she posted. On Memorial Day, we honor the heroic men and women who serve our country. We owe them more than our gratitude. They have more than earned access to quality mental health services, job opportunities, housing assistance, and the benefits they were promised, the Minnesota Democrat tweeted. The tweet appears to have been deleted after she's called out on it. She uh, had hashtag Memorial Day. We honor the heroic men and women who served our country, owe them more than our gratitude. They have more than earned access to quality mental health services, job opportunities, housing assistance, and the benefits they were promised. Again, she appears to have taken this down after she was called out. She clearly didn't know what Memorial Day was all about. She's speaking of Veterans Day, and, and everything she said about veterans is true. They do deserve those benefits. They do deserve quality mental health services. They do deserve job opportunities. They do deserve housing assistance and, and all the benefits. But that had nothing to do with Memorial Day. By the way, if you, uh, and I was asked this question the other day, what is the difference? Because people get confused of what Memorial Day is versus Veterans Day. If, you, if, you, uh, if you're not quite sure, I did a podcast yesterday about it. Go back and listen. Search uh, Just the Truth and you'll find it. You can go to the Odyssey app or wherever you listen to your podcast and search for Joey Hudson, Just a Truth. And, and uh, I, I took a few minutes to give you the history of Memorial Day and Veterans Day because they are two, they have two totally separate goals. 
uh, after Ilhan Omar tweeted that, uh, netizens immediately jumped on and, uh, and said, oh, no, quickly take this down, please. Just like the false paw with your Easter message, honoring people who served our country and giving them service, this is not what Memorial Day is about. This is offensive to those who made the ultimate sacrifice for all of us, wrote one user. Another one helpfully wrote, you're confusing Veterans Day with Memorial Day. I thought we had the VA f- for all of that. Now, how do we give those things to dead people? See, number one, uh, you and I know that Memorial Day, of course, is about commemorating those who gave their lives in military service to the United States and not about military veterans in general. Go back and listen to my podcast from yesterday, and I'll give you a, a, a good comparison of the two. Did you travel over the weekend? Air travel set an all-time record. Some travelers were a bit disappointed trying to get back home last night, though. One of the busiest airports in the U.S. had issued a ground stop, a man, one of the most hectic Memorial Day travel periods in recent history. Yesterday afternoon, John F. Kennedy International Airport in Queens, New York, was issued a ground stop by air traffic control because of terrible thunderstorms in the area. This caused havoc in a weekend that saw record numbers of people who who traveled. And uh, until last night when this happened, it appeared to have gone very smoothly over the weekend. The Transportation Security Administration set a new record mark for most passengers screened in one day at United States airports with nearly 3 million, 2,951,163 to be exact. That broke the record set barely six months ago on the Sunday after Thanksgiving. It was welcome news for the aviation industry, which has been uh, had, had problems ranging from near misses to a lack of air traffic controllers to the problems with the Boeing aircraft manufacturers. The TSA expected to screen a total of 18 million passengers for the period that began last Thursday and concludes today as people are making their way back home. Wow. It was, a, it was a lot of people flying. In fact, uh, it's been a huge time for airlines as the TSA hasn't had less than 2.1 million daily passengers go through security at U.S. Airport since March the 3rd. That's it for today's edition of Just the Truth. Thanks for joining me in the Ph.D. Weight Loss and Nutrition Studio. To lose weight for the last time, visit myphdweightloss.com. If you haven't joined our mailing list yet, visit my website, joeyhudson.com. Just click on the Connect with Joey button so that you can receive our emails and the most up-to-date news. Also, find me on YouTube. Be sure and like, subscribe, uh, follow me on my YouTube channel. Just search for Joey Hudson. Appreciate you spending a few minutes of your day with me. Be sure and forward this edition of Just the Truth to some friends. Just click on the Share button. Send it to a few of your contacts because... If we're going to build our community and we're going to win in the June primaries, and if we're going to win in November especially, we got to build an army of conservatives. The way we beat Joe Biden is through educating people and no better way than encouraging them to listen to just the truth. Hey, keep those comments coming via the Furman Ford text line, 864-477-JOEY, 864-477-5639. Your emails always welcome as well. Joey at joeyhudson.com. We're back again tomorrow. Hope you will be too. Remember, God's got this. He's still in control.